Welcome back to Virtual School Assembly. Today, our guest is Leontine Anglin. Leontine is a former corporate executive turned media consultant and FAA certified drone pilot, which we're gonna have to get into that too. Uh, mm -hmm. She's also a third generation volunteer who organized her very first community event at nine years old. A former cor corporate exec, she managed large scale day of service projects within companies as well as her own nonprofit non charity enabling executives to work side by side with youth and families from local schools and neighborhoods. So the cool thing about what Leontine does is she's been committed to volunteerism her whole life, but she's also helped other people get involved with volunteerism. And before we get into the interview here, I just have to say the, the way that we connected, Leontine and myself, is she represents uh, Ricky Sapp, who was a former guest on the show, uh, talking about his football career in the NFL and she managed the the scheduling and stuff and as i chatted with her i just thought we have to have her on the show <laughs> as well and so you know i was just captivated as we talked and i invited her to come on today to talk about volunteerism so leontine welcome to the show thank you so much for having me tyler and that was a perfect way for us to meet you know anything that gets people talking about volunteerism, like that was just by chance, right? And right. I'm so excited that you, first of all, are doing this, first of all, mm -hmm. um, as an educator, um, but that you see the value in volunteering, especially now that people have time, in quotes, right? Right. And they're sitting there, I'm like, no, 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 you can do something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Don't there be more. Yeah. And, and there are so many opportunities now, but it's not just because we're in a pandemic. There are always opportunities always. to serve and to reach out, and and so many you know benefits of doing that. And we'll get into that. But yeah. let's let's go back in time and start with your story. I, I love in the bio how you mentioned your first service project was at nine years old. Um, so I want to hear about that. But tell us a little <laughs> bit about your childhood, where you're from, and then yeah. go ahead and tell us about that first service project. You know, it's funny, that was a long time ago, but I still remember it. So I'm from Long Island originally, and I was nine. I remember it like it was yesterday. And so I remember saying to my parents, you know what, it's Easter coming up and we should do something. <laughs> Even though I was a very, very quiet um, child, uh, we were really encouraged to do things. Right, so I'm a third generation volunteer, something that I kind of said to buy. What I meant by that was my grandmother was living at the time, was a huge volunteer. She used to travel, not just all over the world, but she actually used to travel to different countries. And she actually traveled to different continents and she would travel to Ghana and she would travel to Nigeria and she taught sign language to young people in villages and other places. And so she would always come back to us with all of these wonderful stories. And so she kind of, planted that seed in all of us of giving, right? Whatever we had, we were fortunate to have it, but we weren't supposed to hold on to it. Our obligation was to share it with other people. So that was just natural for me. I thought everybody felt like that. <laughs> so I really kind of didn't know any different. And I remember this particular um, holiday that came up. Um, I organized this Easter egg hunt, right? And so I literally had to go to all the neighbors and back then you like literally like door knocking. But before I did it, I sat down, I had this piece of paper and I drew it all out and I'm like, okay, we're going to put the eggs over here, but all right, somebody's got to buy them. Somebody's got to boil them. Someone's got to decorate them. I just knew, I can't even explain how I knew how to do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I just always knew how to organize things, organize events, birthday parties, whatever it was. Um, and so my parents said, yep, okay, that's what you want to do. And so back then it wasn't like photocopies and stuff. Like you just, we drew, <laughs> we drew pictures on flyers. We, they were, I don't even know if we called them flyers back then, Tyler, but we literally just wrote like Easter egg hunt and we would just go to the different neighbors and just let them know the date it was going to be, the time, where the kids needed to be. And, um, with my sister and brother. And I think, I'm trying to remember if I had any other kids from the neighborhood to help me, but I don't remember that. So probably not. Um, and then just put it together and spread the word. And, you know, there was no social media. Like we didn't have any of that. There were no cell phones. It was just talking neighbor to neighbor in right. those days, right? And so it, I think that's why it still comes naturally for me to talk. 
it's yeah. just, it's not, it's a reflex. It, it's so, it's, um, it's just second nature. And so that's kind of how I grew up. We were always volunteering. When I got a little bit older, uh, my mother was a teacher. My mother was a teacher for 37 years in the Manhattan School District. And she used to let me come to her classroom and volunteer with the kids. And she had little guys, you know, like um, first graders, you know, little people. And I always was around young people. Even though I was young, there was always someone younger. Right. So it was just something that I've always done, whether I was reading to them or just helping, you know, around the classroom, kind of like a teacher's aide. Um, but I always was volunteering or even in the community at like the local YMCA's and just, it's just kind of what we did, either myself or as a family. And those skills, you, you don't even realize you're gaining skills. You don't even know that you're gaining skills, right. but you're communicating, you're organizing, you're planning, you're finding resources, right? You're connecting dots, you're doing all of those things. And I get excited about it as much today as I did back then. I yeah. just, you know, one of the other things, going back to my grandmother, because she really planted the seed in us, she used to tell us, you know, life is not always going to be great, right? But when you're down, instead of sitting and focusing on it, if you give to someone else, it doesn't change your circumstances, but it makes you feel better, right. and it makes the other person feel even better. So it's just kind of a thing that I've always done. And now when I had to, when my daughter, she volunteers and my nieces and they volunteer. It's just yeah. kind of what, it's just kind of what we do, you know? It so keeps, awesome. I think it keeps the outlook positive. I, I have a story for you now. Um, this is so great because I'm going to tell you about my first service project that I organized. Oh, you I, remember it. <laughs> I, I do because I'm not as awesome as you and I didn't do it when I was really young. It, it's huh? recent for me. And so, okay. but so one thing that as a teacher, I'm always looking for things for my students to incentivize them and to motivate them. And so starting a few years ago, I started doing online product reviews where people would send me stuff in the mail. I'd get stuff through Amazon and I'd take a picture and put it on Instagram or make a video for YouTube. And then I got to keep the stuff for free um, because I'm just posting these reviews. Right. I started doing that a while ago and they would send me cool stuff. I'd get drones. I would get skateboards, really? I'd get backpacks, really cool stuff that kids want. And then in class, we would have auctions and they could, you know, save up their money throughout the school year. Their, their honey money is what we call it. And honey then they get these things. Well, okay. it turns out I started doing a lot of reviews. And in fact, I started getting paid to do reviews and I, I made over a thousand dollars doing these yeah. reviews, but then I had so much stuff and I was thinking, how can I get rid of all this extra stuff I have? Not all of it was appropriate for kids. I had a right. lot of household goods and things. And so I started thinking, okay, one way I can get rid of this stuff is again, just like you, Easter was coming up. And That's I thought, true. let me do an Easter egg hunt. And in <laughs> the Easter eggs, I'll have these coupons for like a knife set or for a vacuum cleaner or whatever I had from these reviews. Yeah. And I got my neighborhood involved and we made it a fundraiser. So they, would, they could donate some money to be part of this Easter egg hunt. And it was an adult Easter egg hunt. You had to be 16 or older to participate. And we got all these eggs. I ended up having a couple hundred eggs and we spray painted them all black and we put them in this field. And then all the adults from our neighborhood came and at nighttime, they had a, a bag with them and I shot the, the starting gun. And literally the Easter egg hunt took three minutes. They run in the field, they grab as many eggs as they can, put it in their bag. And then they got all these cool things that I had, could give away. Thank you. Thank you. And we raised several hundred dollars for a, a foster home in our, in our community. Oh. And that was, it was, for me, it was just a few years ago, but that was my very first service project that I organized, so. How awesome is it? And how funny is it that both our projects were around Easter? Uh, yeah. And Easter egg hunt, specifically. Yeah. That's hysterical. Well, and you did yours in your youth for kids, and I did mine as an adult for adults. For so adults. a little different. <laughs> that's so awesome. And I love that it benefited a foster home because that's another, my nonprofit organization, that's one of our target audiences is young people in the foster care system. Yeah. Well, so, let's talk about your nonprofit now. Tell me a, oh, a, a little sure. bit about it and what you're doing with your nonprofit. Sure, sure. It's called Beyond Expectations. And we are an organization that focuses on providing marketable life skills to youth. And we do it through media and 
um, youth entrepreneurship and STEM. So that STEM is in there as well. Um, but media education is kind of where it started. And I'll, and I'll tell you this, we started back in, uh, what year is this? 19, I want to say 99. It's been a long time. I was a, volu I was a parent volunteer. Uh -huh. And back then, um, we were putting this together to work in conjunction with schools to help young people thinking about going to college. So that's what we started out as. It was really just college fairs. But we were inviting college students, instead of like adults and guidance counselors hosting this, we reached out to college students and had them come and talk to students at middle school level. Not high school, middle school. Because where I, when I was growing up, we, were, we started to think about college early. And so I was kind of um, put off that they weren't talking about college yet in school. And so instead of complaining about it, <laughs> said to some of the other parents, back then I was in corporate America, I was like, you know what? Why don't we do something? You know, we know how to do some things and help the school instead of just complaining about it. Mm -hmm. And we hosted our very first college fair. I, I'll, I'll remember it because we didn't used to get a lot of people to come out to PTA meetings, Tyler. And this particular event, it was part college fair, but also like a health fair. Like we did all this stuff. We had like 200 people there. That's huge because usually we get like 20 or 30 parents. Um, and what, you know, we said, wow we're really on to something because a lot of parents, some of them hadn't gone to college. So helping their young people figure out how to go to college just kind of wasn't in their vocabulary. They were kind of waiting for the guidance counselors in the schools to do it. And so we did that for a few more years. It was because remember back then there was really no Google. You couldn't Google search, right? right. You got catalogs at your house, college catalogs, and you were flipping through them. And some of the students were saying to us, well, that's how I'm going to choose my college, which everyone has the coolest catalog. I'm not making that up. And that's what they, and I said, no, we, we got to do something. So we did that until 2003. And in 2003, we said, you know what? This is something. Like, we're really doing something here. And we, we're bringing some traction in the school district. Why don't we actually form a 501c3 and make this an official thing? And that's kind of what we did. But as that was happening, now the internet was coming around a little bit more. And now people were starting to Google search because we were hosting like college visits. That was the biggest thing. We were taking students and parents on college tours, like get out of the catalog and go on the campus. Um, but now Google is coming out and media was starting to kind of take a little bit of hold. And um, I was working on, this is a little bit of a sidebar, but I was working on a, um, I was a volunteer for an organization called CASA. If you're in the foster care system, it's court appointed special advocates. Right. And um, I was helping to recruit adults to volunteer in the court system for kids who have been removed from their homes. It was gut wrenching. It was the most gut wrenching thing ever. And it still is to this day. And the way I would deal with it, because I wouldn't let the parent, I mean, the adults see me break down, but I was literally breaking down. I would go home and write because writing is very healing for me. I'm a writer. And I'd write all this stuff. And to make a long story short, I had all this stuff. And I was like, I got to do something with it. And there was an ad that I saw where a local television station said, if you want to learn how to be a producer, come to this event, blah, blah, blah. Make a long story short, I went there, connected with some people who were in the media industry, and ended up turning what was those notes and everything into a script, into like my very first short film. Oh, because, no. And it ended up helping to raise visibility it was a short film it took us eight months to do it media is not a joke um uh, but it was the the purpose was let me try to figure out how i can raise the visibility of what's happening to young people in the foster care system and so that's kind of how we got into media because i wanted some of my students to volunteer because there were some professional actors but then there were some kids and we were on the set and the kids were talking to one another about some of the experiences that they had anyway we said, hmm, we need to figure out how to do this media thing. But this was, you know, more than 10 years ago. Cameras and lights were so expensive. I don't know if you remember flip cams. It was like a little itty bitty camera. That's all we could afford back then. So we started making films and we had a filmmaking program as part of Beyond Expectations with flip cams, but it was HD. So it was really cool. And then we would partner with local movie theaters and host film screenings because it was a way 
for kids to see their work up on the big screen is the most awesome thing ever. So that's kind of how we got into media. We didn't start there. Um, and so the other part of what we do is always having young people do some kind of community service project. Like if you're going to learn how to do this, you're going to give back. And so that's kind of what we've been doing with our students. It's giving them skills that they can actually use because some of the students in the foster care system, I may not see them again. Right. Um, they may get moved out of a home. It's just, they're so, they're so transient that we were like, you know what? Every time we meet with them, we're going to do this thing called speed crewing. In, in one day, one session, you're going to write it, shoot it, produce it, and it's done. And so it turned out to be this awesome, awesome thing. And um, that was a great way for me to connect with some of the local corporations and bring them together with local neighborhoods. And they would come out and do a community service project. One of them specifically was to upgrade a local group home. That's exactly what we did. We had like 80 executives from NBC and Comcast. And that's what we did. We painted rooms and we just did all this cool stuff. Um, now, but, we, need a, you know, we need to pause here for a second because... You've given us so much stuff that we need to dig into some of this. So okay, sure. a, a few things. Yeah. One of the things I think kids that are listening to this or watching this uh, are probably thinking about is, well, that's great. And it makes a lot of sense as an adult to be involved in these kinds of things. But what can I do as a kid? And I think what yeah. you've shown through your own example here is you start finding problems that need to be solved, right? So right. in your own community, you're saying, right, well, what's yeah. something that I wish was different and you start thinking about that. And then right. as you get ideas, you take action. Now you you mentioned that it was three or four years into your nonprofit that you became a legit nonprofit and filed the paperwork for taxes and stuff. And the reason you do that is because money is changing hands, it's grown to the scale that you need right. to make sure that you're, you're protected um, legally in having mm -hmm. that nonprofit. But up to that point, you were still doing a lot of good, making a difference and, and solving a problem for your community. Can you right. talk a little bit about growing that and then when you decided to, to do all the paperwork and become a nonprofit, what kind of was involved in all that? Oh, well, let me continue with the volunteering because I, I'm glad that you said that. We continued to make sure that we started to get young people from the schools to help us organize the events, oh, right? Cool. So it, it, it took it away from just the adults. We were the ones who started it. Mm -hmm. But what we would do is integrate young people. And again, we started at middle school, right? So you're talking fifth, sixth, seventh graders, 10, 11, 12 year olds that are brilliant. No one ever asked them what they think. We always tell them what to do, but we very rarely ask young people, what do you think about this? And so they would actually help us organize the events and they would figure out the wording on which schools they wanted to reach out to to invite the college students to come. And then when the college students came, the college students were on the panel. It had nothing to do with adults anymore. We were just kind of like watching the young people kind of organize it together. And I love that you said that. And going back to your example, right where you are, just look around. Maybe there is um, a senior center. Maybe there's a local organization right where you are. You're on Facebook. You know how to create a Facebook page. You know how to do an Instagram. I promise you there are a lot of nonprofit organizations doing phenomenal work and they don't have anybody on their team to do that. You can do that from home for them, right? Pick up the phone, send them an email, reach out, tell them, is there any, and ask them, is there anything I can do to help you? Just ask the question. I mean, you can do that right here, right now. You do not have to sit home and be bored. I promise there's so many people who can utilize the skills that you have that you don't even probably think is a skill. It's just something that you do every day, right? Now, one of the things, uh, when I was a kid, I remember, especially like in high school, a lot of adults would tell me, find service projects you can do, find ways to volunteer because it looks really good on a college application or a scholarship application. And that's true. It, that's it true. does. I know because as a professor, I was on the scholarship committee. I read those essays and I saw yep. what kids did. And it, certainly it's more impressive if kids are serving, if like we would have Eagle Scouts that would have their eagle projects and they do really cool things for their eagle projects that still happens but maybe not to the same level it did 10 20 years ago i think volunteerism is kind of fading from from a lot of areas when when you think of your own experience in volunteerism especially as a youth aside from looking cooler on paper 
what were some of the benefits? Like, how did it make you feel? You talked a little bit about the organiz organizational skills that you developed, but what are some of the other benefits of just being involved in your community? I can tell you what, one of the things that happened by happenstance is you instantly kind of get these leadership skills mm -hmm. because you become a person who comes from behind the shadows instead of just listening to people complain about things you actually are the one who will speak up and say well maybe we can do something about it and then it's almost like you broke it you know you you, you know you broke it now you own it kind of thing and so and sometimes the people in the room um all want to do something but no one speaks up and what happens the more you volunteer and the more comfortable you get with connecting with people you find yourself being the one to speak up and then when you do it it encourages someone else to speak up and the next thing you know everybody has their ideas that they all were kind of holding in but everybody's kind of waiting for someone else to speak up so the leadership skills kind of came immediately the other part of that is you really learn how to plan events not just organize, but actually do the planning. And you get very, very comfortable and your communication skills will strengthen because you all of a sudden become, it's nothing for you to talk to anyone, whether they have the senior person at a company, whether it's someone in your community, it doesn't matter. What you start to find is that people are people, period, <laughs> regardless of the titles that they may have. Um, yeah, there may be that person from nine to five, but at the end of the day, they're just dad when they go home and vice versa, right? All just people. So the leadership skills that come out of it, the communication skills will transcend and they will follow you wherever you go. And I promise I've used those communication skills throughout my entire life, professional and not professional. Um, but also let's not talk about, we are kids, it's fun. <laughs> I don't wanna make it sound like it's all like this serious, serious thing. It was fun organizing that Easter egg hunt. Tell me it wasn't fun when you were organizing Absolutely. that Easter egg hunt. And the biggest part is you take it off the paper where you've planned it. And when it's actually happening, I can't tell you the joy that you get standing back and watching unfold what the ideas were that were on paper once. Because lots of people have ideas. They write stuff down. But it's not everyone that actually implements them and makes them happen. And they do all the work that it takes and it's a lot of work but there's nothing like being in the room with a lot of people who volunteer volunteers are just different we're wired differently we're we kind of come from things from a different perspective optimistic and all this kind of stuff and it's just fun it's just fun hanging out with people who volunteer in my opinion yeah now i think as we've talked about this, it occurs to me that we've talked about more of the leadership role in volunteerism and the organizational and some of the benefits of that. But mm -hmm. obviously, there are a lot of opportunities to volunteer where you're behind the scenes, you're not doing all the organization, you're putting in the work, you're doing the things to help people, but not necessarily getting any credit, not necessarily being really visible. And, and I want to talk about that a little bit. I was actually thinking about uh, an experience we had recently so we have a neighbor that I didn't have a very good relationship with. Mm -hmm. um, they're a little, it's an older couple and they had said something or done something that upset me. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'm not gonna worry about them. They can do their thing, I can do my thing. Well, my 13 year old son wanted to maintain good relationships. And so he would do simple things. And, and this is a service thing. It's not necessarily like a traditional volunteerism thing. But he, yep. he started taking them cookies from time to time and just going and checking in on them because they're older. And, you know, in times of crisis, like during the, the coronavirus, he would just check to make sure they had groceries because people weren't going to the grocery store and doing things like that. And it's amazing the way that our relationship, my relationship changed. I didn't do anything. My son did it. And yep. he fostered this um, relationship with, with our neighbors and now they're dear friends of ours we spend so much time with them and it's those little things that we can do now as you think about opportunities that kids have to help and to serve and volunteer what are some things that come mind as like really easy things to do um well for me um i love art i'm a creative person and so it's interesting you say that when my daughter was young that was kind of the one of the first things that i would have her do I'd always have her like draw pictures. I have pictures of her like with paper and she was like really intense and she'd have her crayons and 
she was always creating something. And in this day and age, I mean, you can just, if you're sitting at home, you can create some artwork. Maybe you can, if you want to do it as a fundraiser, maybe you can figure out if there are people who might want to buy it and then donate the proceeds to a local charity. Do it with a couple of friends. If you can't all be in the same place, you could all kind of do it at the same time. You can meet on Zoom or whatever and say, okay, next Tuesday at six o'clock, we're all going to do this, right? Another thing is, um, I'm just thinking of simple stuff just kind of off the top of my head. I also happen to be a really avid reader and I believe in getting young people to read. Um, you can jump online and have an opportunity to virtually read to some younger people, right? Or even adults. What I like to do, one of the things that I love about volunteerism, Tyler, is connecting generations. Mm -hmm. I, I like to get older people and younger people doing something together. I don't care what it is, right. but listening to one another because there's so much that um, the older generation has to share with us back in the day when we used to talk a little bit more. Um, so maybe that's just calling them on the phone and having a conversation. But I love the reading idea because I love, I love to see books in children's hands. <laughs> uh, but maybe just reading it off the computer, I don't care, but just reading is there something, I'm thinking of stuff they can do right at home, right. right where they are today. Like as soon as you listen to this, you can go, oh, I got paper, I can draw some pictures and maybe I can organize a little art auction and a little, and it doesn't always have to be about money, but I promise if you take a picture to a person in your community, you wanna see a smile on someone's face, do something like that, right? Yeah. Um, even watching a movie at the same time, right? Just little things like that. Organize a quick little movie night. Those are things you can do right where you are. I'm thinking about the social distancing. Maybe you can't go out the house, right? right. Things right where you are. You like to make cupcakes, you know, whatever it is, right at home. Easy peasy stuff. And again, fun. Everything doesn't have to be like serious. You're trying to change the world. <laughs> yeah. it's, it can just be fun. And you just feel like I want to be 10 years old today and just have fun. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I, I, I like that you brought up uh, intergenerational opportunities because I think yeah. back to the experiences I've had with volunteerism and some of the best ones were working. I, I had a, a religious leader when I was in college that yeah. said something to the effect of, it's not really service unless they're grueling on you. And what he meant by that was serve the people who need the most help, who can't do things for themselves. And and so we would regularly go to nursing homes and, and visit with elderly people. And it was usually to do the simple things you, you mentioned, to, to read a book or to sing a song, or just, a song or just to visit, just to listen to them because they want to talk to people. And those were some of the most rewarding things that I did the whole time I was in college. Um, and even I, I have fond memories when we were kids, we lived in an older neighborhood and my parents over Christmas time, we would go Christmas caroling but our, our family, we didn't have like a traditional music background. So my dad played the tuba and my <laughs> mom plays the flute. My brothers would play like the trombone and, and uh, sisters played violin. And I would play like the electric guitar. And we would go Christmas caroling with instruments that did not work together. And we'd take <laughs> our little band around to all the widows and widowers in our neighborhood. And yep. just think to them, and they would just laugh at us because it sounded yep. so horrible. But then they'd invite us in and just talk to us. And I love those moments. Those moments, and don't you cherish them? Mm -hmm. You don't forget them. Listen to us talking about this stuff that happened years ago. Right. In your case, a few years, in mine, many, many years. But every single one of them still stay with me. And I think, too, you know, when things come at you, when life is the way it is right now, there's something about having that level of joy that helps you through it. We're all fighting the same stuff. We're all feeling it. But somehow or another, we're able to kind of move through it a little bit more effortlessly um, because there's this thing about a giving spirit. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm no Mother Teresa. That's not what I mean. I'm just <laughs> saying that when you give like that and you're around people who give like that, you, you're gaining something that you don't even know. It's inherent that um, it's, it's, it is kind of a joyous kind of thing that helps you kind of move through when life just is not going the way you expected it to go. And it's like, the worse it gets, the more you want to give. <laughs> That's just kind of the way that it is. Your mind is always thinking, what can I do? And not what can I do because I need to feel better. Just what can I do? It's just, if I feel this way, there's probably someone else out here who feels worse. Is there anything I can do? Do I have some extra food over here? What is it? Like you always, your mind is always kind of doing that, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. good point. So yeah. again, I mentioned this in the beginning, but part of the way we connected was that you represent Ricky Sapp, who's an NFL football player. And I know that you work with a lot of professional athletes um, yeah. in doing different things. And a lot of them have charities that they run or, or different events that they hold. What are the some of the the things that you've learned in working with others who are starting to do their charities and getting things started and figuring out how to do uh, some sort of service project or philanthropy. What are some of those lessons that you've learned in working with others? What I've learned is that a lot of people have a lot of ideas, but they don't really know how to make them work, how to bring them to life, right? And again, that's another skill that just comes instantly to someone like myself who I'm just like, okay, Tell me what it is you're trying to do. And they'll tell me it. And to them, it was like this big monumental, I've been wanting to organize like a speaking academy. Let's just use that for an example. Sure. And it's something I've been thinking about for a couple of years. Da, 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 da. And I said, okay. And it's almost like, I guess because I played sports too when I was younger, I kind of have this athletic sports team oriented mind. And I'm just like, okay, so What's the end game? What are you trying to do? And let's work backwards. You want to have a speaking academy? What age group? Okay, where do you want it to be? And then my mind just kind of goes into the, the, the term is a consultant, but I just go into planning mode and I just help people take that idea off the paper, Tyler, mm -hmm. because for a lot of people, it just sits there on the paper or it stays here in their mind, but they haven't been able to figure out how to implement. I'm an implementer, right? right. And I just help them figure it out. And if I don't know a particular piece, I'm on the phone. Oh, well, let me call Tyler. He has a, a an awesome program called Virtual School Assembly. Maybe you need to talk to him. And, and my mind, I just start doing that right. for someone else. And I realize a lot of people have all this stuff inside of them. They've been wanting to write a book or they've been wanting to start this and it, they can't seem to get it from here. Sometimes they get it out of here onto a paper and then they look at the paper. <laughs> right. And it just kind of sits there. Um, and so that's kind of what I learned is that whatever skills that you have, my grandma used to say this, anything that you know is something you can teach. Just that simple. It doesn't have to be overcomplicated. Do you know how to use a microphone? Well, then teach somebody who doesn't know how to do that. People are like, I want to do something. And I think sometimes the other lessons to try to answer your question is sometimes people think it has to be a big project. No, it doesn't. It, it could just be helping someone who's been trying to do something, get it done. Right. right. It could be that simple, but that's what I've learned in my years of consulting and working with people, um, athletes. A lot of my clients have been entrepreneurs and coaches. They coach other people, right? right. Life coach and this, but when it comes, when it came to their own stuff, like they were like, I can't get myself organized or, you know, right. <laughs> the things that I just kind of know how to do, I just kind of listen. I listen more than I speak. You know, right now we're doing a lot of talking, but I listen a lot. That's another skill that comes out of volunteering, right, Tyler? Because you have all these different personalities and people have a tendency to want to talk over one another. One huge leadership skill that will also carry you to is to just shh. <laughs> listen. What are they saying? Because they're probably going to give you the answer when they're talking or something that you can say, Oh, I can help you with that. But if all you're doing is blah, 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 you don't get to hear. And then people don't feel empowered to speak, right? You got a bunch of people in a room and no one's saying anything, but you not the sign of the best leader. <laughs> that kind of comes to out of um, volunteering, but that's something that I've learned with helping other people that sometimes they just need someone who confidently, listen, that's another word, confidently can come in and say, I can help you with that. Right. Right. Cool. Yeah. Well, so yep. a lot to process here, a lot of ideas on how to get involved in volunteerism and some of the benefits yes. of that. Um, really appreciate your time today. If, if kids want to know more about what you're up to and some of the, the philanthropies that you're working with, where's the best place to find you online? Best place, go to our website. Um, Beyond Expectations is the name of it, but the, um, the URL is beyond EXP, like short for expectations, beyond EXP.net. That's, that's my heart. That's where all the stuff is. You get to see lots of kids doing lots of things. You'll see them doing STEM stuff and flying drones and with cameras. Like they're just doing all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and that's probably the best 
place to start. Awesome. Well, thank yes. you so much for being here today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you again. Thank you so much for having me. And I really enjoy um, watching what you're doing. And I want to just thank you because you're doing what I just talked about. You're taking something that, you know, you just, you're just doing it from your heart and your soul and you're making it happen. So I respect what you're doing. Appreciate so thank that. you.